Hey everyone, in response to the attacks in Israel-Palestine, I wanted to make a report that provides important context that is almost never mentioned in the mainstream corporate media, and yet we cannot understand this conflict without these basic facts. First of all, in Gaza, there are 2.3 million Palestinians living under an illegal Israeli blockade Israel controls everything that enters and leaves Gaza. This is an open-air prison. Even the former British Prime Minister referred to this as an open-air prison. This has gone on for 16 years, and it's completely illegal. Secondly, according to international law, Palestinians have a legal right to armed resistance. Today, I'm going to look through the letter of the law. I'm going to look at United Nations resolutions that show clearly that Palestinians have a right to armed resistance against Israeli colonialism. And three, Israel is a colonial apartheid regime. It used to be controversial to say this, but it no longer is. Even mainstream Western human rights organizations like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and UN bodies have acknowledged that Israel is committing a crime against humanity by carrying out a system of apartheid against the Palestinian people. These are all very important facts. I'm going to go through the evidence today from mainstream sources showing this, and yet this context is almost always omitted from mainstream corporate media coverage of Israel-Palestine, which always portrays attacks by Palestinians as illegitimate, or the U.S. government claims the attacks are unprovoked, which is completely absurd. Now, because I'm doing this video on YouTube, and YouTube is notorious for censoring videos about Israel-Palestine that criticize Israeli apartheid, I do have to be a little careful with some of the language and the terms I use. Every time I do a video about Israel-Palestine, the YouTube algorithm always prevents people from seeing it, really pushes down the numbers. And of course, this very sensorial environment prevents me as a journalist from being able to fully explain everything in detail. But here are the basic facts that you should know. First of all, the conflict in Israel-Palestine is not about religion. A lot of Western analysts try to portray this as a religious conflict between Muslims and Jews. First of all, there are many Palestinian Christians as well. It's not religious, but this is a lazy analysis. In reality, this is a conflict about national liberation and self-determination. This is also similar to the very lazy and misleading analysis that blames the violence in Northern Ireland on religion. It's not a religious conflict. It's a conflict about colonialism, of Irish nationalists resisting British colonialism so they can unify Ireland, which is partially occupied by British colonialism. It's not a conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Now, because this is a struggle of national liberation and one nation tends to be largely Catholic and one tends to be largely Protestant, people try to map it religiously, but in fact, it is fundamentally a political conflict like the conflict in Israel-Palestine. It is a conflict about colonialism. Israel as a state was born out of European colonialism. Theodor Herzl, the father of the modern political Zionist movement, which called for the creation of a Jewish state in Palestinian Arab territory, he wrote a letter to the infamous British colonialist Cecil Rhodes, who got rich stealing the natural resources of Africa. And in fact, he had an entire colony named after him, Rhodesia, which is modern day Zimbabwe. In this letter to Cecil Rhodes, Herzl said that his plan for creating an Israeli state was, quote, something colonial. He referred to it as a European style colony, which is what it was. And then in 1917, the British Empire issued the Balfour Declaration in which the British Empire officially endorsed the creation of a European-style colonial Jewish state in Palestinian territory. Again, this is at the peak of the British Empire. Israel has always been a colonial project. Then in 1948, militias from the Zionist movement, which sought to create an Israeli state, they ethnically cleansed 
hundreds of thousands of Palestinians kicking them off their homelands in what is known as the Nakba. And today there are now millions of Palestinians in the diaspora who do not have the right to go back to their homeland. This led to the creation of an entire United Nations agency called UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees. And today they have 6 million Palestinian refugees registered. Again, they're not able to return to their homeland because of Western-backed Israeli colonialism. Then in 1967, Israel occupied the West Bank, which is where still millions of Palestinians today live under an illegal apartheid regime of occupation, military occupation by Israeli forces. Israel also occupied Syria's sovereign territory of the Golan Heights, which remains illegally militarily occupied by Israel. And today we're going to be talking about Gaza. Israel also occupied the Gaza Strip near Egypt, and Israel has maintained a suffocating blockade of Gaza. In 2022, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, published a report on the humanitarian impact of 15 years of the Israeli blockade of the Gaza Strip. And there are a lot of very inconvenient facts in here that I want to go through because, again, they're almost never mentioned in the mainstream corporate media. UNICEF notes that the Israeli blockade was imposed on Gaza in 2007, so now it has been 16 years of a blockade. And this is not just a land blockade. It is also a sea blockade and an air blockade. Israel controls everything that goes in and out of the territory. Gaza has no sovereignty. As UNICEF puts it, Israel has significantly exacerbated previous restrictions, limiting the number and specified categories of people and goods allowed in and out through the Israeli-controlled crossings. Israeli forces have largely restricted access to areas within 300 meters of the Gaza side of the perimeter fence with Israel. So they've surrounded Gaza with a massive fence. And whenever Palestinians protest inside Gaza, Israeli snipers shoot them, including not only peaceful protesters, but also medics, also journalists. The United Nations investigated and found that Israel intentionally shot and in many cases killed Palestinian medics and journalists during massive protests over months in Gaza in 2018 as part of the Great March of Return. UNICEF also pointed out that Israeli forces restrict access off the Gaza coast, currently only allowing fishermen to access 50% of the fishing waters that were allocated to them under the Oslo Accords. So again, violating these agreements that Israel signs. Furthermore, the unemployment rate in Gaza is one of the highest in the entire world, 46.6%, nearly half of Gazans, do not have a job. Among youth, it's even more outrageous. Nearly two-thirds, 62.5% of youth in Gaza do not have a job because Israel prevents them from having an economy. 1.3 million out of 2.1 million Palestinians in Gaza, that is 62%, require food assistance. And that number, by the way, has increased because the estimates now are around 2.3 million Palestinians. And there's only one power plant in Gaza, and Israel constantly bombs it, destroying it, which means that the only capacity that it can reach is 50% of the electricity demand in Gaza, which means that there are rolling power cuts, and they average 11 hours a day. So basically, if you live in Gaza, you only have electricity half the time. Meanwhile, Nearly 80% of piped water in Gaza is unfit for human consumption, and Israel constantly bombs the water treatment plant, which prevents Palestinians from having water to survive. This is why figures even like the conservative former prime minister of the UK, David Cameron, have admitted that Gaza is an open-air prison. This should not be a controversial statement. It is an open-air prison camp with 2.3 million Palestinians trapped under an Israeli blockade. This is one of the most densely populated regions of the world, and yet they're treated like cattle. They're not treated like human beings. In fact, documents from Israel's defense ministry prove that Israel 
controlled the amount of food that can be imported into Gaza in order to, quote, put Palestinians on a diet, to control their access to food. This was reported on a decade ago in the Guardian newspaper, and they say very clearly, this is, you know, the establishment British mouthpiece, they say, quote, the Israeli military made precise calculations of Gaza's daily calorie needs, according to files the Defense Ministry released. Israel also maintained a list of foods that were permitted and banned from Gaza. Israel calculated the calorie needs for Gaza's population so as to restrict the quantity of food it allowed in. And a diplomatic cable released by WikiLeaks, which is why the journalist Julian Assange is in prison and is facing life in prison, WikiLeaks published a U.S. diplomatic cable that showed, it quoted, Israeli diplomats as saying they wanted to, quote, keep Gaza's economy on the brink of collapse and... A human rights organization inside Israel called Gisha said, quote, the official goal of the policy was to wage economic warfare, which would paralyze Gaza's economy. And as an example of the restrictions that Israel imposes, it prevents Palestinians from importing things like coriander and instant coffee. I mean, preventing them from having a basic dignified life. This is why it is absolutely correct to say that Palestinians in Gaza are living in an open-air prison camp. And because of that, according to international law, they have a legal right to armed resistance. This is spelled out very clearly by the United Nations. There is no ambiguity. And this was stated very clearly in a United Nations General Assembly resolution from 1980, which is Resolution 35-35, the resolution, quote, reaffirms the legitimacy of the struggle of peoples for independence, territorial integrity, national unity, and liberation from colonial and foreign domination and foreign occupation by all available means, including armed struggle. Armed struggle. They emphasize that. And specifically, they're discussing, quote, the continued violations of the human rights of the people still under colonial and foreign domination. And in particular, they mention, quote, the denial to the Palestinian people of their inalienable national rights. So by mentioning the Palestinian people, they're making it very clear. Palestinians have a right to resist colonial domination, the Israeli domination and occupation, quote, by all available means, including armed struggle. Later on, the same resolution strongly condemns all governments which do not recognize the right to self-determination and independence of all people still under colonial and foreign domination, and specifically names the Palestinian people, along with several peoples in Africa, because, of course, this was a resolution also condemning apartheid in Africa, which I'll be speaking about in a moment. But it also, this UN General Assembly resolution, quote, condemns the expansionist activities of Israel in the Middle East, as well as the continuous bombing of civilian Arab and in particular Palestinian populations and the destruction of their villages. This is a resolution that was passed in November 1980. And for decades, Israel has continued bombing and blockading and occupying Palestinian territory, displacing Palestinians, bulldozing their homes, starving them. This has gone on for decades with no consequences because, of course, anytime there's a resolution in the UN Security Council, which actually has teeth that could be used to take action against the Israeli apartheid regime, well, the US always uses its veto power in the Security Council protecting Israel. So this is why, despite the fact that international law clearly states that Israel is constantly violating international law on a daily basis, there are no consequences. And this is also why Palestinians have resorted to armed resistance, which they have a legal right to, according to international law, because they have exhausted all other means of resistance. Anytime they try a peaceful protest, we saw what happened in 2018 in the Great March of Return, where hundreds of Palestinians were killed by Israeli snipers, where medics and journalists were intentionally shot by Israeli snipers. When they try to protest peacefully, 
That's Israel's response, is killing them. So naturally, they end up turning to armed struggle. And just as the Algerian people had a legal right to armed struggle against French colonialism during the Algerian War of Independence, just as the Indian people had a right to armed struggle against British colonialism, and there were attacks on the British Empire led by Indian revolutionaries like the leftist Bhagat Singh, a martyr who died for the cause of trying to free the Indian people from British colonialism, just as the South African people had a legal right to armed resistance against Dutch colonialism and the apartheid regime, so too, according to international law, do Palestinians have a legal right to armed resistance. This is exactly why so many leaders of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa have strongly supported Palestine and condemned Israel's treatment of Palestinians as apartheid. And this is back in 2014, when it was still more controversial then. I mean, it's it shouldn't be controversial. It should never have been controversial. But Desmond Tutu, a significant leader in the South African anti-apartheid struggle, he said, Israel is guilty of apartheid in the treatment of Palestinians. And this is someone who won the Nobel Peace Prize, which, I mean, so did Henry Kissinger, so have, so did Barack Obama, and he, you know, waged war in numerous countries. So just because you get the Nobel Peace Prize doesn't really mean that much. But for people who care about that, this is someone who is a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And as the Jerusalem Post newspaper reported, which is very anti-Palestinian, this is a pro-Israel newspaper, Desmond Tutu, the noted civil rights leader who became the first black archbishop of Cape Town, compared Israel's treatment of the Palestinians to the apartheid regime that discriminated against blacks in his native South Africa. He said, quote, I have witnessed the systemic humiliation of Palestinian men, women, and children by members of the Israeli security forces. He said, quote, their humiliation is familiar to all black South Africans who were corralled and harassed and insulted and assaulted by the security forces of the apartheid government. Tutu declared his support for the use of boycotts and economic sanctions in order to compel Israel to alter its policies. Quote, in South Africa, we could not have achieved our democracy without the help of people around the world who, through the use of nonviolent means, such as boycotts and divestment, encouraged their governments and other corporate actors to reverse decades-long support for the apartheid regime. Quote, the same issues of inequality and justice today motivate the divestment movement trying to end Israel's decades-long occupation of Palestinian territory and the unfair and prejudicial treatment of the Palestinian people by the Israeli government ruling over them. So this is him supporting the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And Tutu said, those who turn a blind eye to injustice actually perpetuate injustice. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. The most famous anti-apartheid leader, Nelson Mandela, who was the first president of South Africa after ending the apartheid regime, he also made very similar comments in support of Palestine. He openly supported the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, and Mandela said, quote, we identify with the PLO because just like ourselves, they are fighting for the right of self-determination. He specifically praised Yasser Arafat, who was the leader of the PLO. And Mandela said, quote, Arafat is a comrade in arms and we treat him as such. And then in a 1997 speech on the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, Mandela said, quote, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And by the way, I should point out that Mandela was imprisoned for 27 years by the South African apartheid regime, and the CIA played a key role in his arrest. In fact, the CIA gave intelligence to the South African apartheid regime, which was used in order to imprison him. So the U.S. played the key role in imprisoning Nelson Mandela. And why? Because one, Mandela refused to oppose armed struggle. He said that the people of South Africa, black people, have a legal right to armed resistance against the racist apartheid regime. And he, 
in despite being tortured and imprisoned for 27 years, he never condemned that legal right to armed resistance, which is how ultimately the, the apartheid regime ended along with the boycott support internationally. And of course, because Nelson Mandela was always very close to the Soviet Union. And there are even some reports that Mandela was a leading member of the South African Communist Party, which is, of course, never mentioned because so often what happens with people like Mandela, like Martin Luther King Jr., is they are later whitewashed, especially after their death, and they're portrayed as these advocates for, you know, peace and turning the other cheek, when in fact, Mandela always supported the right of armed struggle and always supported the rights of Palestinians to resist Israeli colonialism. And still today, the South African government stands with Palestine and the African National Congress Party, the ANC party, of Nelson Mandela supports Palestine. Back in 2021, the current president of South Africa, Cyril Maposa, compared the Israeli blockade of Gaza to apartheid. He said that it, quote, brings back terrible memories of apartheid. I mean, this has become so uncontroversial at this point that now even mainstream human rights organizations like Amnesty International published a report in 2022 in which it states, quote, Israeli authorities must be held accountable for committing the crime of apartheid against Palestinians. Israel enforces a system of oppression and domination against the Palestinian people. This includes Palestinians living in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, as well as displaced refugees in other countries. Amnesty published a lengthy report that details massive seizures of Palestinian land and property, unlawful killings, forcible transfer, drastic movement restrictions, and the denial of nationality and citizenship to Palestinians, which are all components of a system which amounts to apartheid under international law and constitutes a crime against humanity. And Amnesty International called on the International Criminal Court to consider the crime of apartheid in its investigation in the occupied Palestinian territories. Although I should point out that's not going to happen because the ICC, after pressure by Western governments and by Israel, replaced its chief prosecutor with a British prosecutor who immediately dropped the investigations into Israeli atrocities and war crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories. He also stopped the ICC's investigation into war crimes committed by the U.S. military in Afghanistan. So that's the biased international criminal court for you. But the point is that it's become so uncontroversial that Israel is an apartheid regime that even the former chief of Mossad, which is the top Israeli intelligence agency, spy agency, which assassinates Palestinians. I mean, this is an organization that has so much Palestinian blood on its hands. Well, the former chief of Mossad also admitted that Israel is carrying out an apartheid regime. This is according to an interview published in September by the Associated Press. And it notes, a former head of Israel's Mossad intelligence agency told the Associated Press that Israel is enforcing an apartheid system in the West Bank. This is incredible because I remember a decade ago as a journalist constantly being smeared, demonized, lied about because I correctly stated that Israel was an apartheid regime carrying out crimes against humanity against the Palestinian people. And yet, at that time, this was seen as a very controversial position. Now it's so uncontroversial that Amnesty International, the former chief of Mossad, and other top Israeli officials have admitted this. So the next step to point out is that, again, according to the letter of international law, Palestinians have a legal right to armed resistance against apartheid, just as South Africans had a legal right to armed resistance against apartheid. But of course, the U.S. government ignores international law, and the Joe Biden White House released a ridiculous statement referring to the attacks by Palestinian forces against Israel as, quote, unprovoked. By definition, they are not unprovoked. I mean, there's no mention of the millions of Palestinian refugees 
the de destruction of their houses, the bulldozing of their houses, the blockade of Gaza, the occupation of the West Bank, the borderline starvation diet that Palestinians are put on, the destruction of farmland so Palestinians cannot feed themselves and their families, the humiliation, the racism, the apartheid. By definition, this is the opposite of unprovoked. These are very much provoked attacks. They are Israel is constantly provoking these attacks. And every single day, Israel kills Palestinians. Every day. This violence in Israel-Palestine is not new. Only saying that there's violence when Palestinians respond to the Israeli violence is completely misleading. You're, you don't actually care about the violence if you only talk about the violence when Palestinians respond to the constant daily, hourly Israeli violence. And of course, this support for Israeli colonialism and apartheid is completely bipartisan in the United States. It's not just Biden and the Democrats. Donald Trump, the so-called populist, he and the Republicans are all entirely on board with the Israeli apartheid regime. And at a campaign rally, so-called populist Trump said that Israel needs to very powerfully respond to these attacks by Palestinian forces. He said, quote, it has to be dealt with very powerly. And he said, the U.S. is obviously going to stick with Israel strongly. So Trump's statement was basically indistinguishable from Biden's statement. I mean, they could have been written by the same people because both political parties support these crimes against humanity. And finally, I want to point out another statement from Zelensky, the Western-backed leader in Ukraine. And this shows how absurd it is for people who compare Ukraine to Palestine. They are completely different. Zelensky is wholeheartedly standing with the Israeli colonialist apartheid regime. He viciously condemned these attacks by Palestinian forces, and he said, quote, Israel's right to self-defense is unquestionable. How is Israel defending itself when it's the aggressor? Israel is the apartheid regime that is blockading Gaza, occupying the West Bank, killing Palestinians on a daily basis, bombing Gaza regularly, destroying its infrastructure, keeping its people on a borderline starvation diet. This shows how all of the Western imperialist governments and their puppets, like in Ukraine, all support Israeli colonialism. And meanwhile, if you look at countries in the global south, like South Africa and many other countries that, that successfully got their independence from European colonialism after decades of struggle, those countries in the global south are standing firmly with the Palestinian people and their right to resistance by all means, including armed resistance, that is written into the letter of international law and anyone who doesn't mention that to you is deceiving you. You cannot understand the conflict in Israel-Palestine without understanding these basic facts. And that's why today I wanted to go over these details because they're almost never mentioned in the mainstream corporate media. With that, I'm going to conclude here. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Please subscribe. And whatever platform you're watching or listening on, if you're on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps to promote our material in the algorithm. And if you prefer listening to these as a podcast, you can check out the Geopolitical Economy Report podcast and subscribe to that. And with that said, I'm going to be back very soon with lots more coverage. So I want to thank everyone. I'll see you next time.